uh, that was uh, was uh, carried in our last uh, council and committee meeting. But I will be um, changing my mind at this point in time, and uh, I think that what we have in front of us here is going to be in the best interests of uh, all parties involved, including getting this tender out sooner and uh, getting the bridge replaced uh, in a more timely fashion. I just want to acknowledge that. Councillor Huffman. I can ask you a question directly, can't I, Mike? <laughs> okay, through okay. the mayor. Do you? <laughs> Is... Um, the Bailey Bridge still scheduled to uh, go to Waterford? I can't answer that, but I would think that Mr. Baird can. Okay. Uh, through the mayor, um, so right before, uh, in and around the election time frame, there was a group from Shadow Lake that were looking at repurposing that bridge or a section thereof. It's about probably half, the, half of it to be used to uh, complete a linkage with part of the trail system in and around the uh, high level uh, Black Bridge. Okay. And uh, although we didn't make a decision if they would use it or not, we basically said that there might be a possibility that we, we the county might want to continue using it. It could be sold for scrap or it could be donated. There, there are going to be costs to get it from the current location to Waterford. Uh, but we didn't rule anything out. We just continue to uh, uh, work with that group. And we would then bring a, a recommendation back. The intent at the time, we didn't think it would, uh, would be damaged. Right. Uh, so the bridge would have remained in place until a replacement was was, was uh, constructed. So right. I guess yeah. At that point in time, it wasn't known that it was going to be correct. decommissioned at that point. Okay. Yeah. okay. But we will uh, whatever the outcome is, um, uh, council will make a decision whether uh, to keep it or donate it or some. There'll be some option that you'll decide on uh, okay. as it relates to that Waterford group. Um, I suspect it would be later in the springtime, but uh, that will be back before you for sure. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Councillor Van Passen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I just flipped through my notes from the last meeting, and when we discussed uh, two lane or one lane, but it was very clear that if it was going to be one lane, it was going to be wide enough to handle the farm equipment and hold 100 tons of a, a set of B trains full of corn going across it. We don't necessarily need a bridge where two sets of B trains can pass each other, but as long as one at a time can fit through there and take the weight. So. Uh, like, I don't think we were doing anything wrong, and I don't think that should hold up the process any which way. Um, but the other motion is on the floor. Councillor Martin? Uh, in the interest of learning more about bridges, I would be interested still uh, in the price difference between the two. Um, and not that I want to prolong any repairs to any a dam in any community. However, I distinctly remember having a conversation about an estimated 100 cars traveling over this uh, uh, bridge in a day, comparatively to tens of thousands over the rail lines in Delhi. Um, if there was a bridge to uh, provide council with additional information, I'm wondering if this is maybe the one to get our ducks in a row and make sure that we're investigating all options. Any further discussion? I'd like to pass the chair to Councillor Martin. Uh, for me as well, I think that we've made a, a commitment to um, the citizens throughout this election to, um, for change and to look at different options. And historically, we have never looked at these types of options in this county. We have an opportunity here to potentially save money. We have an opportunity to potentially uh, pres preserve some sort of historic uh, kind of nature to this as we look at you know tourism throughout Norfolk County it's it's a unique not many people coming from the city have seen a single lane bridge and people will often travel far and wide to see that I think that we are failing to recognize while a two-lane bridge may um, the two-lane bridge itself may be the safer option. The reports haven't considered the additional impact that that will have on the, uh, the characteristics of the road itself and the safety of the road down the road. Um, this has been a bridge, a single-lane bridge, since uh, for all time. The Bailey Bridge hasn't been in place since 1992, and farmers have survived um, over all these years with it as is. So to me, I think we've made a commitment uh, to look for 
to, to, to explore change, to find new alternatives, to determine where we can save uh, money if that opportunity is there, and to look at the other benefits um, that keeping the bridge uh, as it is um, might offer our citizens. So um, for that, I will pass the floor back over to, uh, or take the chair back, if that's okay, Councillor Martin. Councillor Columbus. Yes, I, I thought the uh, engineering and the specs were already drawn for the two-lane concrete bridge. I thought that was all done already. Was that not done? Should have been. Uh, uh, through, through the mayor, uh, the, the designs are being worked on. They're not complete. But uh, in, in light of the decision last Tuesday night, we've ground everything to a halt pending. This is the sober second thought, the ratification here tonight, whatever the decision is. So we'll know where we're going to go from here. Do we proceed if the motion passes? Do we proceed, get back onto the design and get things back on track? Or come back in the new year with um, those construction estimates? And again, they're, they're just going to be construction estimates. They're not, um, uh, they're not tendered bids. So, you know, they're you know, going to be a, approximate uh, values. But, uh, you know, we are going to be losing certainly a month at the very least. And if there's more debate or more decision, uh, that can protract things. That's right. Well. We're losing a month, so my concern is if we've got to get prices and everything and specs for a portable bridge, one lane at that, it's just going to delay things by the time we go through fisheries and oceans and get the proper permits in place for the right time of construction. And all we're really doing is increasing our red tape by pushing it off a month. That's why it's the reason for my motion on the floor tonight to get moving on and make things happen. Thanks. Councillor Van Passen. My, my bigger concern would be if that design was authorized last year, asked for last year, why it's not been sitting on Mr. Baird's desk for a while and ready to go. Um, so I got no problem investigating other little options when the current system is not really working that great to start with. Thank you, sir. If I could pass the chair one final time. Um, my question to you would be as well, Mr. Baird, in reality, if we went with one of these prefab structures, would you not agree that, in fact, these would be constructed at a much quicker rate than a two-lane concrete bridge? Um, Madam Mayor, that's a good question. It really depends on the supplier, um, the workload, um, where they're coming from. There is a manufacturer in, in southern states. How they get them here it may only take a couple of months to fabricate, but it may take a couple of months to get here. Um, using the concrete design, the pre-stressed pre uh, girders, everything, you know, that's a much more familiar product that local bridge builders um, employ. So, you know, there, there's going to be advantages and disadvantages to both. Um, I would just be speculating if I knew there was one uh, that may be more affordable or not. Arguably, though, part of the reason that these types of technologies have been developed is not only for a cost savings, it's also for the ease and... and um, sort of quickness of implementation. There are many places that, in fact, move with these temporary bridge structures because they can slide them into place uh, much easier so that roads are closed down. In this case, it's unique that it's already been closed. But this is often a strategy that is used to mitigate how long uh, a road is actually closed for. Uh, that, that is correct. That's uh, the, the main reason for a Bailey Bridge. Uh, that would be considered sort of a temporary structure, but something that was prefab sitting in a yard that could be deployed to get a bridge or a, a river crossing or something like that open for traffic. Okay. Anything further? Councillor Taylor. Thank you, Mayor Chop. Um, this is directed towards uh, staff. If we were to go ahead with the two lane concrete bridge tonight, how long roughly would we have to wait until we could have further discussion regarding comparing prices between concrete and prefab? Okay, so through the mayor, so I understand you correctly, um, our engineers have, have stopped working on that. It's only been a week, so it's not, certainly not the end of the world working away on that. Um, we're coming into the holidays. It's going to be a bit of a lull here too. You know, it, it's not going to be impossible for them to continue the design, come, uh, look at providing some uh, construction estimates, 
and bring that back to you. But at some point, we are spending more money uh, to have the engineers look at these other options. And if we have to, if we decide to go, if council decides to go with the prefab uh, option, um, you know, there's a lot of money that's been spent on the engineering to get it this far. Um, Councillor Van Passen's comment, um, that we have been working on this, but even as we sit right now, the capital budgets historically are approved in October, November. So we know it's kind of full steam ahead. We really don't want to commit to a million and a half dollar bridge um, if you haven't had a chance to approve the capital budget. So um, it, we'll make it. We'll make it all come together. But that, that's you know that might be the option as well. But these delays are going to can add time and, and expense. Um, my what I meant to have come across there is when will the next bridge project be coming up? So if we're already in the process right now for the construction of a two lane when will the next pre like next bridge construction from the ground up be we, coming around we have through the mayor we have three bridges that are proposed for 2019 uh the concession a bridge which is down in mr michelli's area and then a, a bridge structure it's up in i believe councillor columbus's area north of delhi um, that are all being worked on so this one is rather unique uh, because it it's been in the books for such a long time and it is a single lane currently I think the intent was that it be be made a double so that traffic could you know it could accommodate more traffic thank you council Michelli. Um, thank you uh, your worship um, mr. Baird um, through the mayor uh, when would we be able to find out what the actual cost differences are between these various projects uh, through the mayor um, at this point it, it's going to be obviously in January uh, it's going to be very brief we won't get into too much detail we don't want to pay for too much detail um, we should we should have it in time for the capital budget uh, use that opportunity to say here are two prices but all our discussions with our engineer uh, and our staff um, again this is staff's uh, opinion that there's not going to be a considerable cost difference it's going to be other issues such as the time to install the aesthetic piece these other values that you're going to want to look at but from a dollar perspective we still have to do bridge abutments the approaches any piers and all of those things um, so you'll have to weigh out the decision won't be just done on cost I think it's going to be it'll have to have some other merit that it would stand on but uh, to, sorry to answer your question by, by the same time the capital budget is before you so mid-January I, I fully expect to have uh, two figures that, that at least we can have further discussion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Baird. So it is your anticipation, though, that the cost difference will not be huge? Um, through the mayor, that's, pro that's our professional opinion right now. And we would love to have, you know, a considerable cost difference so that could be, become one uh, additional advantage going with one over the other. But at this point, uh, until we see the designs, uh, we see what the engineers come back uh, with, with some costs. Um, we really won't take any guesses at this point. Thank you. So at first I thought this was sort of a discussion on the motion, but it turned into more of a question period. So I'm going to take the opportunity then to ask you, um, Mr. Baird, uh, given the Christmas holidays are here and given that we're going to look at some rough estimates at the, for the capital budget meeting, we're not really losing that much time. Madam Mayor, we, uh, we, we are losing a month, absolutely. We're telling our engineers stop working on that in the event that it's all going to get tossed out. We've got to go back to the drawing board. So it's going to take more time for sure to switch gears and go with a different design. Um, we have a pretty aggressive schedule. We, don't wanna, we want to provide the, the constructors as much time as possible to put in nice sharp bids. Uh, the, other, the other challenge that you have tendering later in the year you have bridge companies that are coming out of the winter season that are going to be raring to go to secure up all their projects they need for the, uh, you know, to get the year started. Um, sometimes if you miss that, their seasons are, are full and the only way you'll, you'll get bids, you'll probably have fewer bids and those bids that you have may be padded up to the point where they might subcontract out components that they would otherwise do. So it's really nice what works well is using the winter for staff and consultants if they if they're involved to do the design work 
So literally, uh, when the snow flies, we're issuing tenders. They're before you for approval. They're, the bids are awarded or the contracts are awarded and the, they just then they start dealing with scheduling, mobilizing to do the work. So they do that, you know, the earliest possible opportunity. That's very successful when you do road projects as well. Uh, a lot of the uh, uh, road builders as well, they're looking for lots of work early on so they can plan their whole season. I appreciate that. What we're, our capital budget, I believe, is January the 9th. Uh, and we're December 18th, and we're days away from Christmas at this point. Uh, myself personally, I made a commitment to our constituents that this council will um, do their due diligence. And to me, to uh, when we're already working on a quote at this point, uh, to look at an alternative, to do our due diligence, to now uh, say that we're not going to do that and we're going to move with the original recommendation, that concerns me. So I guess we can move to... Uh, Councillor Columbus's motion. If there's anything further? Okay, a seconder. Councillor Geisens, all in favor? Opposed? Motion's been defeated. Okay, so now we're going to come back to vote on the original motion that council directs staff to investigate options and costing relating to the construction for Road 45 bridge to include two a two-lane Class A bridge and a one-lane prefabricated structure, and that any work on the design and or engineering of the current two-lane structure be suspended until the options have been presented to council. I need a mover for the motion. Councillor Geisens and seconded by Councillor Van Passen. All in favor? Oh, pardon me. Discussions? Uh, to Mr. Beard, with this uh, portable bridge, is there any manufacturer here in Ontario or would it be coming from the U.S.? Uh, through the mayor, I believe there's, uh, there's a, a, a big constructor in, this, in the southern states. There's also a, a company sort of in southern Ontario, but I'm not sure. They, they, they're the ones that have supplied uh, the pedestrian style bridges that you're familiar with the Quants Park and here in Wellington Park, whether they have designs that are wider or more span or more, more load, uh, we'll have to, to look into that. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor? That's carried. Okay, next one is the user fees. Okay, Councillor Columbus, again, if you could uh, give us some insight and couldn't debate was the uh, the item with respect to user fees and. Uh, I've got, I do have a motion here, but my thought was, I think there's 600 user fees altogether. Is that right, James? Something like that? Uh, through Madam Mayor, yes, Councilor Columbus. And basically, the, the main issues that we had was the use of ice rates for uh, ice rates, and that was for um, uh, items number 165 to 179 in last, last week's uh, committee package. And the other one was development applications under planning from number 431 to 480. Those are the ones that were questioned. So that, that includes about 60 of those 600 items. And I thought it would be worthwhile putting on a motion on the floor to pass all the rest of them, save and accept those that uh, were identified by persons or counselors around the table. So I, my motion here reads uh, that resolution number 13 of the Council and Committee minutes of December 11th, 2018 be deleted in its entirety and replaced with the following therein. The staff report 1837 respecting proposed 2019 user fees and service charges be received as information and that the proposed fees and rates be approved with an effective date of January 1st, 2019 with the following exclusions, ICE rental rates, fee numbers, 165 to 179 
and development applications under planning uh, agreement, planning agreement, and maintenance and other fees. Those numbers are from 431 to 480. In total, that's 60 user fees. And uh, all the rest of them would be approved if this motion passes. I'll open up the floor for discussion. Councilor Rabbits. Um, thank you, uh, Mayor Chop, and uh, through the chair to uh, Mr. Columbus and the rest of council. Um, I think uh, that does a very good job, uh, Councilor Columbus, of encapsulating uh, the concerns that we had at the time. Uh, the only thing that I did see that could potentially be missing was um, our concerns regarding Friday the 13th. And I just wanted to provide an opportunity uh, for Councilor Martin to perhaps pick a couple or identify all of the user fees associated with that event uh, to be amended into this motion, because I think that was the intent of, of council at the time. Uh, it might have been 60 items plus Friday the 13th. Councilor Martin. Thank you, Councilor Roberts. Um, yes, Port Dover uh, PD-13 fees, numbers 571, 572, 577 through to 580, 583, through to 590 and 592. Thank you. Just to highlight for council, um, there will be a separate report on just on standalone report on PD 13 coming forward in February. So rather than tie this to the January one, you could just defer those to, to that date rather than, okay, yeah, that's great. I'm going to just pass the chair to Councilor Martin. My only concern with this is, as I stated the last time, I'm, in one sense, I'm, I'm happy to move forward. In the other sense, I don't feel enough deference is being given to the fact that, again, a couple dollars doesn't seem much uh, to us sitting here today um, for various fees and activities to, to be raised. but. Uh, to somebody with five kids that's taking certain lessons and so on, it is a fact that it is uh, the um, sort of historically lower income bracket families that are most affected by user fee increases. And I received actually a number of letters uh, from people commending us on deferring the user fees on that basis and specifically saying with multiple kids, you know, it gets expensive when you're looking at a couple bucks here and a couple bucks there and every single week adding those up. Again, it doesn't seem like a big deal to us, um, but I'm just concerned that it's arbitrary. We're gonna raise it at inflation and yet wages aren't raising at inflation. In fact, I don't believe our last QP agreement was uh, increased at the rate of inflation. So to me, that's where I would almost rather proceed through the budgets to see you know, whether or not this is absolutely necessary or if we can make up this amount of money uh, somewhere else and, and give everybody an equal opportunity to be able to use all of these services. I'll take the chair back from uh, Councillor Martin. Further discussion, Councillor Geisens? Well, I have the same thing. Basically, we're saying, well, we've got to have more money because we don't have the kids anymore. And that's the problem that we have. You know, we, we uh, make it, I don't know whether it's 1%, 2%, and it keeps going up and everything like that. And the kids and the, and the families can't afford it. The more people we get in there, the more money we would make, as far as I'm concerned, because you've got other ki you have kids. The problem is all the kids go, don't come. They're, they're, like you said earlier, the family can't afford it. So theoretically, we would be better off taking some of that away and having more kids on the, on the, on the rink, and something will come from it, not only for the, uh, for the juniors and all of those, because we're losing some of our junior uh, hockey players as well. So theoretically, I think we need to look at what is the best thing that we can do and in the end, you may have more money in your pocket rather or in our pockets than we would have uh, by raising it. I'll tell you that much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Councillor Huffman. I would just like to say that I completely agree with everything that Councillor Geisen said. Um, as a parent of four children, oh, it does mean something to me. <laughs> um, and having been a hockey coach and on different executives and just watching fees and things like that, just nickel and dime year after year after year. 
and um, it does, it gets expensive. And I think we need to, um, I've always felt that, and I know, um, and I'm sure Mr. Cridlin will, will uh, confirm this, we don't make money off of the arenas. I understand that, correct? Through the mayor, yes. Um, we're lucky to cover 30 to 40 percent of, of our yep. arena costs. So we are, general public is already subsidizing our arenas. Right. To quite a um, and I do think over the years of um, being in the arenas for um, hours and hours on end and, and some different experience there is that I think there's different ways to look at some of these um, just to kind of reframe and step outside the box. And um, I, I appreciate the deferral because there's a couple other things I'd like to, to look at in, in regards to the ice, ice rental in particular. But I think overall, when we're looking at the health and wellness of all of our um, citizens, especially um, our youth, uh, we need to be very cognizant of the costs that we're, um, we're asking people to pay. Thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion? Councillor Columbus. Well, I, I agree with the statement. Someone have to be crazy not to get as low a fee as possible, right, to, to use the facilities. But if it doesn't come from the user, then it's got to come off the levy. Somebody's got to pay for it. It's either Paul or Peter. Somebody has to pay for that ice time or whatever it is that or the, the user fee if it's not being paid by the user. And I've had calls this past week from people who say they do not want it on the levy. They'd sooner see the user pay for it. I'd like to pass the chair uh, to Councillor Martin one more time. I think, though, that there needs to be some effort or some demonstration that we have attempted to reduce uh, costs with respect to these areas. So as we look to shave off costs off the budget in general, we should also be looking at where can we save money on these user fees so that it's not coming out of the levy, but that it's an actual savings with respect uh, to those facilities um, that impact the user fees directly. One of those examples we suggested was to look at uh, those areas where the county is currently competing with businesses in the private sector. And I would argue that in fact, um, we are very likely as a county subsidizing um, areas where people shouldn't just be going to, to a private business as opposed to the county uh, paying administrative costs and so on that that private business actually has lumped in. But because we're not seeing the breakdown of costs, it makes it seem like it's cheaper, but in fact, it's driving the price of these user fees up. So that's my perspective on, uh, on that issue. Councillor Van Passen. Sorry, I'll thank, take the chair back thank in. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, that's why I was looking forward to a discussion on that for points have been brought up by all the councillors. I don't think people are aware how much we subsidize arenas and that's always been the battle like what are we willing as collectively the community of Norfolk County we are willing to subsidize those so that the kids have a place to play hockey because they cannot afford to do it on their own we run all sorts of programs that we subsidize it because we accept the fact that if we don't do it our young people have no place to go have nothing to do and that just leads to worse things but your comments about Maybe we're in a bunch of businesses we shouldn't be in, that the private sector will do just as well or better and cheaper. Um, and maybe we need to look at getting out of some of those other areas and focusing our limited resources where they, we can do the most good with them. And so I look forward to that discussion on the whole big picture. And um, again, I, you know, we, um, Councilor Columbus had a point by pulling this that uh, like the hockey fees, they're set for the year anyway. It would be next year before the increase. So we had time to discuss them without changing the budgeted amounts for the arenas. Um, planning fees uh, we were going to talk about, but the bigger picture, I'd, I'd like to discuss that as well. So. Okay. Uh, do I have a seconder for Councillor Columbus's motion? Councillor Rabbits? Okay. And all in favor? Opposed? I believe it's. Can I have a show? Of
Okay, so just to be clear, the, the motion is as follows, that resolution 13 of the council and committee meetings of December 11th be deleted in its entirety and replaced with the following therein, that staff report FS 18-37 respecting the proposed 2019 user fees and service charges be received as information and that the proposed fees and rates be approved with an effective date of January 1st, 2019 with the following exclusions, ICE rental rates, uh, fees number 165 to 179, and number two, development applications, agreement maintenance, and other fees, fee numbers 431 to 480. And further, uh, that staff be directed to report back with more details on the fees related to the ICE rental rates and the development applications. That was moved by Councillor Columbus, seconded by Councillor Rabbits. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay, that's been carried. Um, okay. Okay, now we'll move to the committee appointments. Uh, we have a motion to finalize the council member appointments. Okay, and everybody should have that in their package. Uh, so do I have a uh, mover for the uh, committee appointments uh, as included? Councillor Taylor and seconded by Councillor Rabbits. Any discussion? Councillor Van Passen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. There was a change circulated by the clerk. Is that included in the new motion as opposed to this? Uh, through you, yes, uh, it was included in the, the motion. All those in favor? Carried. This is right now? Aren't we notices of motion? Okay. Uh, are there any notices of motion? Okay. Moving on to bylaws. Um, I have that bylaws 2018-53, 2018-60, and bylaws 2018-12 through 2018-105 inclusive, and bylaw 18-OP-2018, and bylaws 69, 70, 72, 74, and 75. ZED-2018 and 71 and 73. Z-2018 as amended by council be approved uh, and signed by the mayor and clerk and affixed with the corporate seal. Do I have a mover? Councillor Van Passen, a seconder. Councillor Rabbits. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, Councillor Van Passen. Could you repeat that question? Um, like 218.53, we're uh, setting aside money for drainage works. Is that the county's portion of work on a drain, a municipal drain? Or is that the total and that's going to be uh, collected back to the adjoining property owner or from the adjoining property owner? Page number 289. Okay, Mr. Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mayor, uh, Madam Mayor. Uh, Councillor Van Passen, uh, when it comes to billing for drains, uh, we do the work up front, yeah. and there is almost always a municipal portion. And uh, so, obviously, the municipal portion would 
be on our, our tab, and then we would bill out any, uh, any property owners along that drain, and it's based on an engineering report on uh, the, their share of, of that drain. This number is for the total work, and then a portion of it will be built out to the adjoining property. True to Mayor, that's correct. Yeah. Thank you. Any further questions? Councillor Martin. Questions pertaining to the same two bylaws, 2018-53, uh, 2018-60. Um, I was hoping for additional information on this as I know nothing about it. Um, and it adds up to 700,000 plus dollars. So are you, can we speak to this tonight or is this something that can come back in, in a report or? I'll take it for a drive around the county. It, show if you it the assists range. council, um, so this was um, the third read of uh, drainage bylaws. So the drainage uh, process, the petition drain process is one whereby residents present a position and council has to consider it. And there is all sorts of different stages. What happened with this one was council was lame duck. So this has been delayed uh, several months. Um, there is staff reports that are previously existing from the previous council that we can certainly circulate. So if you do desire to defer these to the January 15th meeting that is that is obviously your your right and you can look at it um, and we could provide you uh, uh, public works could provide you pr further analysis on it and would public works deem this drainage work as uh, needing to have a rush put on it uh, through the mayor th th this work has been already completed it's, it's contained in our budget. This is just an authorizing bylaw so that we can get these things paid and we can start to do the, uh, the billing to, uh, that's a portion to those landowners that benefit. So it, 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 they really are more housekeeping, but the, uh, the drainage budget does include money for these works. So we'll do two or three major drains each year. I understand. Thank okay. you. Any further discussion? Okay, so I had a mover with Councillor Van Passen. Sorry, further discussion? Moved it. Councillor um, Van Passen and seconded by Councillor Rabbits. Discussions finished. All those in favor? And that's been carried. Um, at this point, I think we were actually, we were going to stop and take a break as to whether or not we wanted to continue with the meeting here this evening. So um, I'll open it up to you guys for some discussion. Thoughts? Councillor Hoffman? I think we're done. <laughs> uh, cer certainly, I, I won't... Uh steer council in any way whatsoever <laughs> it does certainly support staff's recommendation to approve the integrity commissioner award if you continue to delay it because already one of the advices that I'll be giving you is that I don't think we'll be able to if you cancel this RFP I don't think we'll be able to issue and get another one before you for final approval before the March 1st date of the legislation so if you do push this report and it isn't considered until January 15th, then I'm going to come forward to you and I'm going to say instead of April or May, it'll be June. Um, so it does, I wouldn't want council to make whatever decision you want, but I wouldn't want to surprise you with anything, certainly. Why would there be a reason that we couldn't hear this on January the 8th? So to be clear, you can hear it on January the 8th. And there's absolutely nothing stopping you from doing that. We have uh, the proposals are irrevocable, which for four months, 120 days, when we let them. So in plain English, that means you can defer your decision. What Mr. Grozell is correctly telling you, we don't know what your decision is going to be, but his advice has, uh, I would agree with his advice, which is to say that if you... Uh, if you engage through the RFP process, everything's sort of uh, level playing field. If you make a decision otherwise to issue a new RFP, we probably can't comply with that in time to meet the statutory deadline, March 31st. So, sorry, March 1st, thank you. 
So staff are not trying to do an end run to get a specific outcome from you. You have every right to defer this to January the 8th. Uh, but we how, long, how long does the RFP need to be open for? Uh, well, there's... Uh, we wouldn't do one few, uh, less than 10 days. We have to look at scope, et cetera. Et cetera. There's a, a lot to the answer, part of which I don't want to deliver in public. Um, it, it wouldn't be automatic or we, we need to appear. But if at the January 8th meeting, theoretically, if we did decide to reissue the RFP, uh, really new terms could be drafted by the following council meeting. Uh, well, you can't bind yourself. You cannot make a final decision on January the 8th. You can only do that on the 15th. Okay, but the terms could still be drafted. Draft terms. The, the initial RFP document was well over 100 pages, and the review of that initial document took five, six months. So obviously now that we have the document, we can we can fast track it, but if, if there's a, a major change in the scope of service, we have to go through that in detail. We have to send it back to purchasing. They they have to review. We have to have the solicitor review. So it's it's not necessarily a matter of something in a week. We're talking a month uh, to get it done and then to issue it. And then if there's any addendums that come in, then there's processes that we have to follow. And then it, and then the the staff report itself has a, a three-week review period from when it's submitted. That's from when it's done and submitted. So there is there is certain timelines that really make it hard, especially during the budget deliberations when I'm really occupied with a lot of work here and, and you're occupied, which is good, but it just makes it very hard for our staff to actually do that quick turnaround. And I wouldn't want that to be a surprise to council on, on January 8th. That's the only reason for mentioning it. Okay. I'm, I'm confused because I thought you suggested earlier that we that might be a point where we deferred it. Again, to reiterate, you can defer. The staff are just trying to raise a flag to you so that if there's one outcome, uh, you don't feel as if you've been railroaded to only get one given outcome. Because we will have a procedural problem and a timeline problem. We're raising that flag to you now, but you absolutely have the capacity to defer this this evening. Okay. Um, one thought that I have is we could actually um, hear this at the CIC meeting and we could call a special meeting for the same day to ratify this the same day by council. There would be nothing prohibiting us from doing that. Myself, I'm exhausted right now, and this is something that I'm, uh, I would like to spend some time and attention to as opposed to rushing through this and making a decision that um, is not the best decision. Okay. Councillor Van Passen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Now that I know how complicated that process is, um, if council did not have an integrity commissioner in place on the 1st of March, the clerk is required to get one is that process going to take six or eight months or is he going to hire one the next day um, direct question um, so the process and, and cur currently council's bylaw does require an integrity commissioner the thing that you won't get till March 1st is you won't get any conflict of interest uh, legislation so if we don't proceed then you don't get any advice on that you have to go get your own personal legal advice um, in terms of the code of conduct, we need to have an integrity commissioner now. To provide council with some context, um, we did, um, there was a potential for fr frivolous and vexatious complaints against current council members during the election period. So that the previous council passed the integrity commissioner bylaw and the code of conduct, including an integrity commissioner in advance of the election because there's a blackout period within it where we can't hear complaints uh, of code of conduct. So during a campaign period, we didn't want to have people using that as a campaign tool. So there is that thing. So now what would happen is we're in a one-off scenario. So at any time that there is an issue that I need an integrity for, commissioner for, I would need to go out and get three quotes for the service and I'd issue it immediately because a 60-day there is a 60-day requirement for a report to this council, so I cannot go against council's bylaws. And so that, that would be how it happened. 
but it is substantially different than a, a, an RFP process, which is, a, again, a very thorough process, and it takes a lot of time and effort, and we just really have been very careful with making sure that all our I's and T's, I's are dotted and T's are crossed, sorry. It's late. But I, everybody's late. Let's go home. <laughs> Councillor Rabbit. I would like to suggest that we get through just one more piece of business, and I think we can get through it quickly. Um, it's regarding being a bylaw, respecting the appointment of council members. We've had a motion, but we haven't actually gotten through IMC um, appointing that bylaw. Or, is, or, or did we get through that, those three pieces there? Through you, uh, um, we're, we're going to bring forward that bylaw to the, the January 15th council, but we have the confirming bylaw of council that will enact all your appointments immediately tonight. Okay, so I'm good to attend a board meeting tomorrow. Yes, yes, okay. Yeah. Councillor Van Passen. Um, can we call a special meeting of council ahead of the CNT meeting on January the 8th to discuss it. it's going to be an in-camera session anyway. So if we just show up an hour or so earlier and uh, get it done then ahead of that meeting. I think that sounds like a great idea. But that limits it to an hour to an in-camera then to kind of do it quick. The only, I believe we were starting an hour early already for that meeting. Okay, so it would be a 1 p.m. start then that day. Okay. Okay, Councilor Martin. Just a friendly reminder that uh, we have a meeting at 1 o'clock with some residents That's of Ward 6. That's true, uh, I'll, would you be able to come in at 12 o'clock and we can move that one up further? Okay. Okay, so I have a motion before me that bylaw 2018-96 being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the Council of Norfolk County at this council meeting held on the 25th day of September 2018 be passed, signed by the mayor and clerk and affixed uh, with our corporate seal. Do I have a mover? Councillor Geisen, seconded by Councillor Rabbits. Any discussion? All in favor? Okay, and that's been passed. And I have another motion. Um, it's been moved by uh, Councillor Rabbits and seconded by Councillor Geisens that there being no further business, council be adjourned at 10.25 p.m. All in favor? Carried. Success. <laughs> I've been that real hard. 